Okay, welcome back from our break, everyone. Uh, up next, we have a working group session focused on bootloader code improvements, and that's chaired by Alan Jude. So I'm going to turn it over to Alan. Right. Are you seeing the slides properly? Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, the goal today was just to talk about the current status of the boot code and where some of the uh, weak points are and figure out how to solve those and where else uh, we want to go uh, with the boot code and, and how we want to improve it uh, over the, the near term and the long term. Um, so I've kind of broken the presentation or the our time down into a couple of things. Uh, the first being the update mechanism for the boot code. Uh, now that we've moved to having the ESP actually be mounted in FreeBSD 13, uh, that makes updating it a less of a, a manual affair. But uh, compared to in the past, where you just used gpart boot code and, and treated it like the other boot code, and we're just slapping this image of a partition over top, it's maybe a bit more involved. Uh, but we want to figure out what the right way to do that is and, and make sure that uh, it's there are good instructions to follow and that it works for the very large majority of people. Uh, and that brings up the my kind of second uh, topic of choice for this one was figuring out a, a fail safe mechanism for boot code or a fallback mechanism. So that you know if you do update your boot code and the new boot code doesn't work, you don't end up with an unusable system, having some kind of mechanism uh, to be able to fall back, whether that's just installing it as an extra option and it ends up showing up in your EFI BIOS as, you know, tr just try the old boot code or something, or if it can be completely automated, uh, which obviously would be preferred, especially in the remote server case and things like that. Uh, then another recent thing that came up was um, as part of the switch to OpenZFS, uh, the instructions that come up when you run zpool upgrade reminding you to update your boot code went away. Um, those instructions were bad and needed to go away, but um, the loss of that reminder uh, is is maybe slightly suboptimal. Um, and so there's been an effort to revive that, but the I think the best thing there would be having a link to the, the section of the handbook that describes how to update the boot code, and someone would have to write that first before we can link to it in the OpenZFS source code. <laughs> um, then I'll uh, highlight some work done by Colin Percival and Mitchell Horn on boot performance, uh, both measuring it and improving it. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit more about where else we'd like to go with the boot code and what else we'd like to add. Uh, and then we'd also like to spend a little bit of time talking about testing and QA and, and CI for boot code and what we can do there. Uh, and then hopefully other people have uh, things they want to talk about or uh, questions that we can answer. Uh, so first, obviously, they make it why? Okay, these aren't supposed to be animated. My apologies. <laughs> um, so right now, there's quite a few different ways you end up booting, uh, which is, you know, not necessarily what we would like, um, but it's a, a fact of life at this point that most systems. Uh, nowadays, uh, because of the way the installer was built, have a GPT partitioning scheme. Uh, and they actually have both the legacy and EFI boot code installed by default, um, because you know that's most likely to work on every machine. Um, but that was one of the reasons why the instructions given by ZFS, which were from back in the day where it was GPT legacy and nobody used EFI, um, and it resulted in quite a few people accidentally overwriting their EFI system partition with the BIOS boot code. Um, and that would cause their system not to boot anymore. And that would uh, result in, in unhappiness. Uh, so most disks will have one of these five configurations. Uh, and if we're going to build an automated tool to update your boot code, uh, it's going to have to be able to properly detect which of these five you have, and then figure out what the right thing to do is, which could be interesting in the case of the both uh, option, where you know we can look at the sysctl like mockdep.boot method and figure out which one you booted with. But 
is it safer to update both uh, if you have both rather than you know having a second boot option that's uh, becoming stale over time? Um, so coming up with a an updater for the boot code. Um, in particular, ZFS uh, is the main driver behind this. You know, in the past, with UFS, uh, the boot code generally didn't change very much, uh, if at all. And so it wasn't a regular part of people's updating routine to worry about updating the boot code, because all it did was uh, have just enough UFS knowledge to be able to load the loader, uh, or the loader to load the kernel, and boot it, and that's all you really cared about. Uh, with ZFS, uh, there are constantly new uh, on-disk format features coming, and these require that the bootloader understand those in order to be able to boot from that pool. And so we, uh, on a regular basis, have to update the boot code in order to deal with that. Uh, the only other real option there is to do uh, what Ubuntu and, and some other distros have done of having one pool for the root file system. Um, that uses basically no ZFS features and is is meant to be you know backwards compatible with ten years ago, uh, and then have a second pool where you put your more important files uh, and they can use the ZFS features. Uh, but that really takes away a lot of the advantage of having boot environments and so on. And so we have updated boot code that can boot the latest and greatest ZFS features, but you do have to install it uh, before you can boot from that newer version. And so that's led to uh, frequently having to update uh, your boot code. And you know we've not, uh, still to this point, come up with a, a very good way to do that. In the legacy case, it's pretty straightforward just with the, the gpart boot code command. Uh, but it's not you know, as seamless as hopefully it could be. Does Warner want to join in? I'd love to not do this alone. <laughs> I've been chomping at the bit to say something for a little while now. I just saw your video. I actually video. wrote an install boot script years ago to test the bootloader. So that touches on two of the issues here. It's been in the tree for ages. I've been trying to get traction for about three years to, for people to have an install boot that section of um, the, you know, like you have install world and install kernel, you have install boot. Um, and in the, um, uh, case of, um, you know, using as part of, you know, the upgrading process, it's just a thin wrapper around a script that does this. Um, one of the things is, uh, that's, that's, that's really needed here is, um, <clears throat> like you said, knowing what exactly to upgrade. Um, and I think some of that, at least initially will need to be your do as you're told, unless we have like a minus minus dwim flag, um, by default, we should not guess at what's going on because we will guess wrong. You, you have mm -hmm. a 13.0 a, a um, USB stick in your system or a 12.0, and we don't want to upgrade that automatically, for example. <clears throat> yeah, uh, or you know, the, the whole point of the ESP is that it can contain the bootloaders for a bunch of different operating systems, and we don't want to muck up the other ones. Or you know, if we, we've got okay, then we use EFI Boot Manager, which I wrote a number of years ago, and um, um, and you you can easily select that. Now, Supermicro has issues with that. You can do a couple of OSs, but not a lot. Um, and others sometimes just drop the persistent um, stuff. But there is a, a set of protocols that we can follow. We've registered EFI FreeBSD. That's why we installed the bootloader in EFI FreeBSD bootloader so that we can create a boot environment uh, variable, not a ZFS boot environment, sorry, a boot um, UEFI environment variable so that we can boot off of that uh, by default um, with a fallback to the default one, which according to the spec was only supposed to be used for um, removable, uh, media. removable media, but according to reality is, is, is the universal fallback. Yeah. Um, Windows installs its own um, and creates an, an boot environment variables. So at least one is um, always there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but uh, sometimes more than one can be difficult. With Linux, sometimes two is doable. Um, but the, we should be looking at the standard things and having uh, some kind of fallback or some kind of recommended port for something like Refind um, yeah. to, to cope with the situations where um, your bio sucks and rather than having it suck to be you, um, you uh, can, uh, um, yeah, you can, can do that. Yeah, having a, a port of Refine that actually installs itself and sets it up properly would be really nice to have. Yeah, it's 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 always tricky. Yes, very tricky to uh, you know try to make something that's going to work for almost everybody and not work uh, very badly for anybody. Because <laughs> uh, I guess one other thing we've uh, I was wondering about is can we start branding our loaders with some kind of version number so that we can actually tell what is currently installed versus um, well, what's we, we, we've been existing? In, we've been branding our bootloaders with a version number since 1993. Yeah, I think um, they've all been version 1.0. <laughs> no, that was the we, 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 no, it's, okay. we're, we're to like 1.3 or 1.4. Okay. Um, but, uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, if we, those we are usually, to, we would need to solve the, why aren't we updating this ever problem? Yeah. Um, we had, we used to have a date and time stamped in it, but the reproducible builds put the kibosh on that. So, um, that's, um, <clears throat> That, that is interesting. Um, yeah, Manu may be right that it's 1.1 everywhere. I know that Spark used to be 1.3. There was a 1.2 somewhere. Yeah, I think the versions um, were usually but, bumped related to changing the actual yeah, but that's the, the legacy, that was or whatever. Yeah, that's the legacy bootloader, not mm -hmm. the EFI bootloader, which right. is 1.1 everywhere. So. <clears throat> um, but like for the case of install boot, how do we even just reliably detect which partition contains the boot code you booted from? Okay. Um, okay, there's, there's a couple of ways that uh, you can do that. Um, one is uh, you can look at boot current and that will tell you the boot variable set to look at and that'll tell you exactly what was booted. Um, the other way is it's what's mounted on boot EFI. We is require it? people, we, we, we require, well, um, one way to do that is require people to mount the partition that they want to update as boot EFI. Right. The boot loader, the boot, it's been slowly making its way into install boot. Um, the other way you can deal with that is, um, uh, you know, is to sanity check and make sure that what's mounted is what was booted and, and you know, have a force if, if not. Like, um, um, can... The other way is uh, an environment variable. I was you just thinking... You looking for things to mount in right. general. But I was wondering if, if the EFI bootloader could set a cam with the GPT GUID of the ESP that actually did the booting. So oh, you when you have like... multiple disks, you can tell which ESP it was. You mean like the two that it already sets? There's a EFI, um, there, there's a, a, a boot one uh, set of variables that are set by boot one.efi and there's a loader set of variables that are set by loader.efi that tell you exactly um, where you were booted from. Oh, good. So that we have, we have we some have information. We have all the tools here, we just need to use them. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hate to sound like, oh yeah, I've done all of this, but I've done all this and integrated none of it. So, I mean, it's, it's, these are great questions. Yeah. Um, the other thing that one can do early in boot, and I have code to do this in my tree that it, does, it, it doesn't work reliably, so I've not committed it, is I've got a dev EFI um, geom that, looks at the booted um, root system and creates a dev EFI root. And it create looks at the ESP 
that was used to get there and creates a dev uh, EFI ESP. I wrote that before I wrote the code that added the extra environment variables and it needs some updating. I haven't messed with it in a while, but when I first did it, it wasn't very reliable and I didn't want to answer questions from people about why doesn't this work? I had primarily done it so that in the embedded space, we can produce images that just mount dev EFI root and it doesn't matter where you what do it. What device it comes from, you don't have to try yeah, to. Yeah, you don't have to, it, you don't even, you know, you, and you don't have to rely on other labels as well. Mm -hmm. But other labels worked well enough that there was not a lot of pressure to, to, to get that done. But yeah, so, like, I think for the case I'm looking at, it's mostly when there are multiple disks, especially right. if you're mirroring them or doing RAID Z, and you might right. have the ESP on all of them. And right. A, we want to update all of them, or, although maybe not at the same time, I don't know, uh, probably at the same time, but having uh, that GM device point to the one that we actually booted from uh, might be quite helpful there. Right, and um, you know that's the, that's the other set of, 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 of worry. I have, um, I have redundancy, but I don't want to use like Gmir to get the redundancy on my MS-DOS or on my FAT partitions. Right. Because um, I, I want one of them mounted all the time because it's convenient, but um, uh, I want uh, the other stuff um, not mounted. Uh, so how do we deal with that? And um, the install script, one of the things I was thinking that would make sense is if you just give it no args, it does the, the, the rock stupidest default thing it can do. And if it can't, it says, forget it. Right. You know, and, is boot EFI and, mounted? If it is, does it have a FreeBSD directory? Update the file. Exactly. Um, but it can take a number of args that would tell it how, what to do. And you can give it a number of partitions to update and it would, and whether or not to mount them and unmount them or, and, and things like that as well. Now, this discussion is a little bit um, e, uh, EFI centric because I want the, the same stall boot I wanted to, to deal with. Um, uh, you know, I've got this really weird ARM board, but it has a U-boot uh, port and package. And um, I would like to update it. And I would like to, it to know that, oh, it's all winners. So that goes on to offset blah, blah, blah of this device, um, you know, based on metadata that's in the, um, that's, that, that, that's installed. Mono and I have done a little bit of work in this area, um, but we've not, um, finished it. I think Manu even has a script to do the U-boot part of this as well. Um, and part of it too is, uh, uh, he just said on IRC, he does have a script. And, and part of it too is, um, you know, like you said, for legacy or dual, I want both updated or I just <laughs> want, I know it looks like I booted from EFI, but I want you to update my legacy. Should be a valid thing for it to do. Uh, maybe with yeah, especially in the recovery case where you're booting from a USB stick, our installers try to boot EFI by default now, uh, but that doesn't mean the system you're trying to repair booted with EFI. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, so, so that's uh, you know that's um, you know that 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 is some of the uh, concern. Also, our boot and GPT boot um, thing. You have this on your list here. Um, what do we do? when there's an error. I have 128K boot partition and our current boot- I think it's uh, 156. Is, is, yeah, it, I was gonna say it's 200K. Um, but- I mean, in fairness, that, when I did the one, when I first wrote GPT boot, I think UFS boot was sitting at eight and a half K. <laughs> right, and, and up until I started messing with it, uh, Still quite small. I mean, PMBR couldn't handle anything over 64K. Well, because that was enough for anybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then we added encryption and more hashing algorithms and a bunch of other things. Uh, and thanks you know, to Colin, we can do more. Of it. I, hear. I think that added a little bit to it. Uh, well, yeah. I think ZFS was already <laughs> running close to the 64K. And then uh, we went, <laughs> went to town on it. Yeah. I think we, we have both now. Mm -hmm. So we can have one image and, and, yes. and also expand things a little bit. And, you know, I think since 10.1 or so, the installer has always made the boot partition 512K. Uh, but there are lots of people who did their own thing at some point along the way. 
uh, and run into the situation where you know their FreeBSD dash boot partition is some smaller size uh, than what it takes to fit the current one. Uh, and so yeah, the script will need to handle the the error there, but Again, it'd be really nice if it could spit out a URL to the handbook telling you how to, you know, shave some space off your swap partition or whatever and make it bigger. Yeah, that was <laughs> one of the problem. options I envisioned for install boot too, <clears throat> which was, you know, do that shaving so that um, we wouldn't have to have people walk through it manually. Yeah, Obviously, that's one of the really nice. Default. Yeah, but, uh, but one of the really nice things about GPT is that the order of the partitions doesn't end up mattering so much and and you can you know you, the boot partition doesn't have to be the very first one on the list it can be at any offset you know because uh, the other thing is the zfs installer defaults to rounding the zfs partition to uh, whole megabytes so there's sometimes enough slack left after the last partition as well uh, to fit an updated bootloader you know and so you know, you can get really complicated with the script of like, well, we don't need to shave off the swap if there's more than, you know, 512k of, of free space, some other offset in the partition table. But, you know, it gets really complicated and you start looking at all the possible options there. Yeah, Patrick had mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the problem that I was trying to solve with boot EFI uh, ESP, which was, you know, Device, device names changed and it's not the thing you think it is. Um, and was saying that GPT ID would, would be good. And I, I agree with that. Having things be a little bit more, um, a little bit more robust than they are now, um, or at least uh, you know, having that information available and widely publicized. One of the problems with the environment variables I did, you know, is I didn't put them in a man page. And so nobody knows about them. I mean, Alan, you've worked a lot with the boot code and you've overseen yeah. several people working on the boot code. And <clears throat> you and I have done contracts working on the boot code and yet you didn't know about them. Yeah, I, I haven't <laughs> I'm, run, not, I'm, not, I'm not digging yeah. at you, you know, by saying that. I, I hope you understand that. Yeah, I, um, didn't, I didn't randomly run KM that sees an extra couple of GUIDs in there and be like, I wonder what those are for. <laughs> exactly. I wanted um, to touch on, <clears throat> before we get a little further. Um, <clears throat> someone already pointed out there's an open bug against 13.0 actually, because the installer tries to mount EFI, but it uses like dev ADA zero or whatever. If you change a disk and because it's not a fail okay mount, you suddenly fail to boot. Like if you insert a disk and it doesn't have the ESP where it expects, because we don't use some kind of soft label or something like dev EFI root that you're mentioning. Oh, I thought, I thought the installer was using the the GPT label, the dash L flag when you partition, but maybe it's But not. we also probably, if the mount is not optional, if it's not yeah. like a fail okay mount, that, but yeah, it says it no that it wasn't, it was using like dev ADA P0 or P1 or something like okay. that. Yeah, that should definitely at least have the fail okay, I think. So that was bug number for reference, uh, 256179. Can you send that to me on IRC so I can find it later? Yeah, yeah, I, I will. It's actually um, on Discord, but I'll okay. forward it over to IRC because we don't have enough platforms to put all together. I'm on most of them, but I can't read them all. I can't read scroll back on all of them. Uh, but kind of getting to Warner's point about you know durability or or you know uh, having it work consistently, um, you know something I've been talking about at Dev Summit since 2018, I think at least, is uh, having some kind of fallback process uh, for the boot code. Uh, because, you know, uh, when you update it and it turns out not to work, there's, it's, it's quite a faff to fix usually. Uh, and often requires find some other media to boot from. And, you know, if you're a poor user with one FreeBSD machine, that might be difficult. <laughs> Uh, it's like, oh, find some other machine that works and make a FreeBSD USB stick to repair your broken FreeBSD machine. Uh, yeah, the, this, is, this is an area that we need to, to look at, but part of it, EFI has some things like this right now. The loader um, doesn't search as hard as it used to because you can set up 
um, a number of VFI variables. Now we don't when we install it by default, and maybe we should, so that you can say, oh, this one fails, quit out of this, quit out of this one, and we'll go to the um, prior one. Next one. Yeah. We'll go to the, yeah, I'll go to the next one if you if you set that up. Um, GPT boot, it's harder. Um, we have ping ponging boot uh, inside of GPT boot. Um, and even in GPT, I even did a GPT uh, boot.efi that does the same ping ponging um, that's based on some dodgy uh, flags that we stole from uh, some header bits that have since been, re Intel's tried to reclaim them. Oh. <laughs> Um, they re reclaim the field and, and tell people not to use it in the reclaim since they're not actually in active conflict right now. Um, but yeah, these these are issues, particularly um, in you know, particularly when we've got um, you know people wanting to deploy servers. You know, it's not just hey, I, there's this one server out there. You know, when you when you have teens of thousands of servers. Um, you know, you want something that will fall back and fail safe to, um, you know, something something sane. And, um, you know, how, you know, GPT boot does a good job. Um, you know, if you boot the kernel and something weird happens, if you have a watchdog, it'll reset and GPT boot will boot the next thing. Um, you know, before it's, you get to the point in the boot where you, you update it. Um, and this is another area, I, I absolutely agree that I would love to oversee people working on this, but I don't have time to, to go through this because it's actually quite um, quite tricky uh, to get bulletproof, but it's actually relatively easy to get. Um, uh, At least less, most less, of the way there. You know, it's less fail, fragile oh, than it is now. Yeah, if we, if we fail in 10% of the cases, we could go to you know failing in 1% of the cases, it's not a lot of work. But that last extra little bit is difficult. Yeah, because uh, uh, with the, the loader for the EFI version, the fallback, we have to make sure that the loader exits uh, when it runs into an error and gives us the opportunity to fall back to something else instead of just printing an error message and then sitting there forever. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some, some versions of the uh, bootloader that do that. Um, and I've tried to eliminate all the ones that touch DFI. This panic in EFI used to be implemented as printf while warn. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. in the legacy code, it is printf followed by a four semicolon semicolon. <laughs> yeah. It would just Maybe that was it. I, I, yeah. I forget, you know, but basically, and there was one that did that in assembly. <clears throat> Jump dollar. Yeah, JA dollar or something, uh, one of the MIPS ones. I think on one of them, I found that that actually makes my laptop get quite warm if you sit it at the broken boot prompt. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what? What you had another number of other things. So we we talked about installing, um, and we've got bits and pieces. We need someone to thread them together. Maybe it's mm -hmm. we have enough bits and pieces to make this a GSOC next summer, or um, an intern student. Um, or something like that. I don't know the, the right way to get that worked on. Um, that's one of the problems, bigger project problems. We, we don't have a good uh, way of, of keeping projects like this on a list somewhere that's up to date and doesn't go stale quickly. And ensuring that we have a way to do the kind of state transfer that'd be required for someone who's you know, not sitting here watching this talk right now to be able to get up to speed and know, oh, you know, there's this thing GPT boot and it uses some flags on the partition table to ping pong between these two partitions and we need to somehow extend that so it can decide to ping pong itself with something else or whatever. Yeah, extending it to GPT boot itself is hard. Yeah. You know, who watches Well, you basically would somehow have two different FreeBSD dash boot partitions without confusing the PMBR code. Yeah, that could be interesting. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting notion though. Um, cause I, I don't, yeah, it might not actually be possible. You'd have to make the boot zero that's concatenated with, that's got boot one concatenated on it in the FreeBSD dash boot partition, do the failover or something, I think, because 
you only have the 400 and something bytes of assembly in the PMBR to make the decision. I don't think there's room to add parsing the flags out of the partition table to it. Um, okay, so we have avoiding disaster. There were a couple of other things about performance mm -hmm. we're getting short oh, yes. on. Oh, yes, so let's move ahead. Uh, then we just, you know, we have the same problem with ZFS. Uh, I'd like to restore the upgrade instructions, but uh, it'd help if we had a tool and then some instructions uh, that we could point people to. Right, right. And um, I can write up or at least get started on a, uh, a thing. And, and uh, so we have a place to point to. Yeah. And, and you know, next version. Because right now it's like, yeah, hope for the best. No. Yeah. <laughs> And we could at least have the ZFS case. Uh, yeah, well, in particular, yeah. how to, I guess, teach people to be able to use Gpart show and figure out which one is the one they're booting from and, and update it. You know, find the right device name for GBD boot part or boot code on the legacy case, or, you know, how to yeah. figure out how to mount their EFI partition if it isn't already taken care of by FS tab for them uh, and, and deal with that. Uh, so yes, on to performance. Uh, so Colin uh, has done a bunch of work previously on a system called TSLog, which basically logs timestamps in the very early part of boot, where tools like Dtrace and so on just weren't available yet. Um, and he's recently extended that to go as early as the loader. Uh, and on my next slide, I have a, a, a flame graph he made out of that. Um, and he's so he's identified the problem, but not the root cause at this point. Uh, and then secondly, uh, Mitchell Horn has been working on upstreaming some code uh, from NetApp uh, called Boot Trace, which basically takes over just around the time where TS log stops, including profiling all of the RC scripts. Uh, and so with those two things in, it becomes a lot easier to look at what's uh, slowing things down during boot. Uh, so from Colin's flame chart, you can see that uh, a lot of time in the loader is spent loading the font. Uh, and there might be something we can do about that. I think the font file is only 170K or something. It, it doesn't seem like it should take all that long. Um, but I think in total, he found there were over 20,000 IOPS happening in the five or so seconds in the loader. Uh, and if there's any way to make that smarter, that would likely uh, save a lot of time on the boot process. Yeah, it's probably a legacy of um, back in the day in the 90s. Um, where there were enough BIOSes that couldn't do more than one I.O. at a time mm -hmm. or one sector at a time. And so it, all the code was kind of written assuming that, and we don't um, try to do any read ahead or clustering or anything like that. Uh, there's a little bit of read ahead, but I think it tops out at 16 kilobytes of read ahead. Well, and this is, this is not EFI, right? This right, is this is not the EFI case uh, because I think Colin wasn't sure if some of the older instance types on Amazon can boot EFI or not. I think well, they can, but. So the other constraint you have is you don't know, um, <clears throat> with the bias interface, uh, there may be a flag that we don't check, but I feel like there may not be. You don't know if it actually has to be in the low one meg because not everything can bounce buffer. And so that's also the reason. So we actually, or I think we do check for that like so floppies, you can't bounce buffer. So it actually, and it has to be a small, like broken string was doing really small IOs to buffers on the stack. Um, and so I think it's also true that we just do lots of small IOPS for the non-EFI case. And I don't, that may not be fixable versus, I mean, I would say that we should, if we want to optimize, we should really probably focus on EFI going forward and not spend a bunch of time on libi386. I think some of the things might not really be fixable without breaking other systems. Right. And so some of that might just be getting more of the AWS instances to booting with EFI instead. Yes. I think that's a better use of time, <laughs> if that makes, if that's possible. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, I don't know that, but I don't know how much further Colin's got. Uh, he's been a little busy lately. Um, but, you know, his goal is to make AWS instances boot up more quickly. Uh, and then for the boot trace stuff I mentioned, uh, Mitchell has the first two reviews for that out, which is mostly the kernel side of it. There's a user space side, and then the reviews for that will come up uh, soon as well. Uh, but uh, 
there are the URLs for that. So Mark Lineman had suggested that we get together and have a monthly call. So what might make sense, Alan, is for you and I, and we can send it as an open invite to the, the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, set, you know, a monthly session where we just go through and bang out a requirements doc or bang out this tribal knowledge that you have and that I have that nobody else has. Um, and there, I'm sure there are others. I would invite uh, Emmanuel Vado to this too. because Right. And Kyle Evans and uh, yeah. Tomas Soom for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of those have a different, all, all, the, all the people there have a different piece of the tribal knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that would be useful, I think, you know, even if we just did it, you know, two, three, four times, you know, a couple hours a month isn't going to kill anybody. Yep. Um, you know, we could uh, improve the state of the art quite a bit. So, um, and then also maybe set the framework for, you know, somebody having an approachable document to get the context to be able to do the little bit of work that's required. Because right now, exactly. Paging all of this in is, uh, you know, is, is, is quite costly. Right, and it involves, you know, begging for time from each of the five people we just listed, uh, and, and and you don't know which of the each of the five you need. Exactly. So yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. So, um, it's been a perennial problem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One of the questions was uh, Bacall. Um, was suggesting that we write a man page and let people code to that. So I think between the two, I think it'd be good. Yeah, like, I don't know if if something more like, not the, the architecture handbook or whatever, but uh, for HBSDCon a couple of years ago, I wrote uh, a big chunk of my paper was just describing how the, the legacy boot process works in all the different stages, uh, starting with, you know, uh, a more handbook like document that walks through those steps for the two or I guess three, right? We have legacy, EFI, and U boot are the main boot types. And maybe Justin will want to jump in and add whatever PowerPC does to the list. Um, but there's a kid. Yeah. To write more of it. No more. yeah. Uh, but I guess the other question was what else uh, would people find useful or are people working on for? Uh, the boot code. Like I know uh, Kyle and yourself uh, have recently extended the Lewis stuff and created the vendor menu option, uh, which I'm sure anybody who tried to add a menu option to the fourth in the past uh, greatly appreciates the fact that they can just make a little file with a little bit of boilerplate and just add a menu option and not have to do the craziness that was required in the past. Yep. But is there anything else people would like to see there? Uh, it'd be helpful to have an idea of, of what people's uh, pain my, points and wish list are. My, my, there, there's two things I think that are um, in, in IRC right now. Manu is working on a tri kernel um, that will, uh, he's, he's describing what, what that will do. I think it, it will try to try it a couple of times. If it fails, fail back is where I'm going. Oh, yes, uh, I know we've looked at, I looked at something like that for ZFS in the past, of uh, keeping a counter of uh, boot attempts. And if, you know, three times you didn't, when, when the system comes up all the way, it resets the counter to zero. If the boot code detects that the counter is, you know, three or more, it will boot a different boot environment, like a rescue system or a phone home system yeah. or something. And then Chris says that there are a list of known working configurations for a console through IPMI. Um, Basically, if your if your vendor supports um, doing console redirect, um, then generally the vendor puts that in the right con out variable, and it just works. If it doesn't, you're kind of screwed, and we don't have good fallbacks on EFI. Um, and the way you specify things in EFI is a little bit funky. We would need uh, ACPI parsing to um, potentially do it completely, but we could get a lot even without that by having us splitting, having the EFI bootloader uh, console still do both, and then having an EFI video and an EFI con or whatever we want to call the names that are specifically, this is video, this is console, or uh, as well. And that would also let 
people that do not want the graphics ever um, to have bootloaders that do that. I mean, that's a really cool feature by Tumas. That's great for my laptop, but uh, for servers that I can't get the rendered stuff, it is less helpful. So, um, uh, so, so that's um, the, uh, Crest is also hitting on another issue, which is we don't communicate from the bootloader to the kernel what the console should be. And that's one of the things you don't need ACPI in the bootloader to fix. And I have an idea on how to do that. If somebody wants to do that work, um, let me know. I'll be happy to schedule a Zoom call and give you a brain dump. It, it basically involves uh, checking the, or passing the, the, the UID of the, cons of the serial device to the kernel and then having a little bit of code in the kernel that uh, looks for that and uses that as opposed to the old style um, IO port address to select the console. So, so um, schedule wise, we've, we're kind of getting bumping up close to where we need to cut it off. Um, and we're going to take about five minutes and then come back for one or a session on workflows, which I think is also going to be a little tight to fit into the time allocated. So I definitely don't want to start late. Um, so I would encourage folks to continue discussing, since I clearly we're not done, um, over in the hallway track. Uh, we could also, um, after today is over, the hallway track will be open if folks want to continue talking about uh, this topic or quite possibly Warner's topic. Um, after the main track is officially over, the hallway track will be open for quite a while. We can continue talking about things there. Um, but let's go ahead and go uh, into about a five minute break and then we'll come back and Start with Warner session on workflows. Thank you, Alan and Warner. Thank you. You bet.